to come into it. Okay, got it. And I'm going to do it as well because we're just making doubly sure here. There we go. So, welcome to this webinar given by the Curious Piano Teachers, uh, where we're going to be looking at five steps to take five, I've called it, five steps to teaching the entertainer by Scott Joplin. My name is Dr Sally Cathcart um, and I'm one of the co-founders and the directors of the Curious Piano Teachers and I'm joined today by Hannah O'Toole and her dog Hugo, who you'll see looking in the background, um, and Hannah is our community manager. Hello Hannah. Hello, lovely to see you all. And Hannah is here today to help with questions and she'll be feeding things through to me. Sharon Mark Taggart, as you know, uh, my fellow director, is still on maternity leave after having her little little girl Damaris back at the beginning of December. Yeah. So thank you to everybody who's coming. Thank you to everybody who's watching this on catch up. We're going to get straight, straight down to it. And I can see we, we launched a poll just before we started. And so far, the results are that most of the people who are watching this are might be going to teach it in the future but quite a few of you are already teaching it and you some of you are thinking about it so i'm actually going to end that poll because i think that was an interesting point to start with so what we're going to do today i'll just shut my page up and how could you could you um pin me maybe yes let me just see if I that would be fantastic now. okay what we're going to okay How's that? I'm good. Yeah, okay. Um, I'm going to start by sharing my presentation. Um, and we'll be coming and going a little bit with this as we go through. I'm just going to, before I share, I'm just going to double check I'm in the right place. Nearly, nearly, Sally. Right, share. So, five steps to teaching the entertainer, which as a lot of you will know, makes an appearance on the Grade 3 ABRSM piano syllabus for 23-24. So one of my jobs, as well as being director of the Curious Piano Teacher, uh, none of them are particularly jobs, but um, I also act as syllabus consultant for ABRSM. So I am one of the people who is responsible for having this piece. And I thought, let's, you know, it's about time we had pieces that the kids really like, that they want to play. And I think that is why it's proving so popular. But of course, we want them to play it in the right way. And we, the teachers, want to get the most that we can out of their learning experience. So, um, first of all, I'd like to say um, thanks to ABRSM for allowing us to use the sheet music for this and also to record the, the, the version that I'm going to be playing for you. So we're going to start, I'm just going to play it through, this particular uh, version of The Entertainer. And it's a, a lovely arrangement, I think, done by David um, Tionyak, especially for this exam syllabus. And I think he's done a very, very fine job indeed, because he's kept the spirit of the piece um, without compromising too much. Um, you might get a bit of a blast of the full entertainer later on, but let's start with this. And by the way, you, this is obviously in the, uh, in the book, in the ABRSM book, this one, with my post-it note on the front. But you can also download it from the ABRSM website as a digital download. So it can be downloaded as a standalone. And I know Hannah's got the link that she's going to share with you where that will take you to the page where you can buy this as a digital download. That's right, it should be in the chat just there now, actually. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Hannah. And I like doing this because um, I think it, it, you can introduce the piece without them absolutely knowing it's anything to do with an exam. All right, so here we go. Thank you. 
my little blip in the middle, I suddenly started thinking of the original version there and trying to play that and then go, no, I can't go that direction. Anyhow, that gives you um, the idea of, of this particular arrangement of the entertainer. So let's get going. What we're going to be doing today is we're going to be working through these five steps to teaching a piece. And this is something that we developed in the Curious Piano Teachers back in November and December as part of our How to Teach Classical Music. Classical, as in the period of classical. But actually it works for any period at all. So we've got a uh, first set First thing to do is to analyse the piece, and the second thing to do is to brainstorm it. And this is for you, the teachers. Yeah, This is what the teachers have to do first in order to make sure the learning, which happens in uh, section three, four and five, to make sure those steps are really, really solid and successful learning experiences for your students where motivation remains high. And the final performance is one that they really feel that they have ownership for or ownership of even. So let's go back to um, number one, the analysis. I'm going to be taking you through this and having a look at this. I do just want to say, for those of you amongst you who are members of our community, all these uh, resources I'm going to share are can be found in the various curiosity boxes and we'll be giving you an update on that in the newsletter that will come out tomorrow. So first of all, let's have a little think about the big picture and I'm going to be working through, this is another sheet we have, the musical content analysis piece. For me this is where I start my teaching journey with any piece of music and I go through it and I really look into what that piece of music has in it, what are its, what are, what's it made up of, what are the tricky things to teach Where's the harmonies working? What are the melodic features? What do the students need to know before they can start learning that piece? So I'm going to be taking you through these very quickly. Now, if you've got the piece of music with you, then do feel free, get that pencil out, get scribbling all over it. Um, let's go back to here though. So first of all, I'm going to think about the key signature. Well, that, that's fairly straightforward, obviously it's C major. Time signature. This is an, uh, an interesting one. It's what we call cut common time, a la breve, two, two, two minims in a bar. And I'll tell you more about ragtime in a bit, but it's always in two beats in a bar. And the original is in two, four, rather than in two, two. And if you imagine two, four, it's full of semi quavers, etc. So um, that's why we've got it here in two, two. Rhythmic features, okay, so what have we got rhythmically? We've got the syncopations, of course, haven't we? For example, going into uh, the uh, bar five, you know, that is one rhythmic feature I would want to pull out. The second one I'd want to pull out is, for example, in bar, I need to look on here, I can't read, uh, bar 11, bar 11 with the quavers, third line down, third bar in. Those are the two particular rhythmic features I'd want to look at there. Melodic features, this is all going on my analysis sheet, you see, all these things. Um, melodic features, all right, so you have the six, the opening six, which is in bar five. And that comes back quite a number of times on that first page. So you get that opening six, in that bar, bar five, and the, li and the line below, and the line below that. Uh, what else do we have? Oh yes, and then we have some really interesting little chromatic -y bits. There we are, going in bar seven and eight, so that second line down, second bar in. Where you have that D, C, D, D sharp, E, and the hand has to contract its way in like this to, to be able to play them. Um, and sometimes that just comes out as D, D sharp, E, yeah? For example, the upbeats into bar four, bar five, that, that is just the three notes. And you know, that comes back five times, I count, um, all together. The C, D, D sharp, E, or the E, F sharp is also another version of that, and that comes back five times. I love little details like this, because that tells me if I can teach them that, then actually they've learnt an awful lot of the piece by the time they can play that, yeah? So it's pretty essential that I get that sorted out. 
And the, the third little um, musical melodic feature is e, uh, in bar seven. So second line, third bar, E, C, D, E, E, D, C, E. That little drop of a third and then back up. Again, that comes five times. Okay, so I've looked at those, lots of patterns going on there for those melodic features. Next thing I'm going to look at is the structure of the piece, the overall bigger structure. So it has an introduction, yeah, which is a repeated phrase. So once they can do one, the, the, the next challenge is moving them down. Um, we have an introduction. Then in bar five, we have the A section. We know that. Da, da, da. for them to do. A lot easier to get your head around the fact that it goes, oh, A, the same but slightly different. Oh, A again, the same, much easier. And then when we go into bar 17, it takes that little motif I talked about, the E, C, D, E. So I don't, I've called this a codetta, a little coda, just to finish off this section. Codetta. And then, ah, oh, this is something a bit different in terms of what the melody is doing, so we'll call that B, shall we? We'll call that section B. Ah, oh, the same B section again. Ah, oh, but now it does something different, so it's B1 again, yeah? So we have B, B1, What's going to happen next? Spot, that was the same as B again. Lovely. And then we have a coda. So, such a straightforward, very clear um, structure to that. Let's move on. We now have Let's talk about whether it modulates or not, whether anything happens. Yeah, I think that <clears throat> there are definitely some modulation, uh, two of them, I think two main modulations, and that is on the third line, where it goes briefly into G major. Uh, it, you could say it doesn't really modulate. However, there is a, there is a cadence here. happens there and similar on the next page at bar 27 I think off he goes into G major and then and then he gets rid of it straight away I love that F natural it's just oh let's go on another direction shall we lovely lovely um so let's look at phrases we've, we've looked at the big structure and now the smaller structure, the phrase structure, I think this is another interesting one because we have this bit, we know, we've got very familiar with that, you've got to learn to live with that, haven't you? Um, and then it's sort of, it's a question and a little answer. So ragtime has its roots in African music, okay? And Part of African music is this idea of call and response. So I'll show you a bit what I mean uh, right now, actually. I'm going to show you what I mean right now. So there is a, here's a, here's a song, and um, it would have been sung by people working on the railways. There would have been the, the leader of the pack, 
and all the other workmen who were working there. And the, the leader sings the call. They go, Hill and Gully Bride Ho! And all the workmen, you all have to stand up for this actually to do, you have to pretend you've got a pickaxe, okay? You've got to pretend you've got a pickaxe. Up you all get, get your pickaxe, and you have to go, Hill and Gully, as you hit the stones on the ground, okay? You're breaking up the stones. You're doing the response, I'm doing the call. Here we go. Hill and Gully Bride Hill and Gully. Hill and gully rider, hill and gully, and a low down bend down, hill and gully, and you bet him in your tumble down, hill and gully. Get the idea? I do the call, you do the response. That is absolutely a feature of African, of African music. And as I say, ragtime has its roots in African music. So I think that's what you've got. There's the call. Here's the response. And again. So, lovely. You could call it a question and answer. I think it has its roots in call and response. And that happens pretty much in every single place in the A section, I think. Absolutely every place it has a call and then a response. Something similar happens in the B section. for four bars yeah if you listen to the difference between it, it's almost like a, it is something different there whereas this one I just want to go but you know phrases are subjective you can argue it either way um, so call and response for the phrases, I think, is the most important thing. Let's move on. Articulation. What have we got for articulation? There isn't really anything except it says the left hand should be lightly detached throughout. I think if you listen to my record, what, what I've just played again, you'll find I don't just do legato in the right hand. I'm doing a whole variety of little things according to how I feel at any one time. <laughs> as long as we hear a distinctive right hand and left hand. That's really what matters. But I would say generally left hand deta lightly detached and right hand probably more legato. Dynamic range. Here's a really interesting one. Um, in the original, it's mostly piano and forte. Mostly piano and forte in the original. Um, in this one, if you look at it, uh, the range goes from pianissimo through piano, mezzo piano, forte and fortissimo. For me, that's a bit too much. For me, that's a bit too much. But what the arranger is trying to suggest is you need to be covering a full range of dynamics. You're not going to be asking your students to, to really uh, go for it on the fortissimo. You want them to play loudly because it's the kind of the central point of the piece, but they don't need to try and play fortissimo because if they do, they will struggle with tension and all sorts of problems will start to, and it won't sound very nice. Nor do they need to try and play pianissimo because uh, up here because it's already happened. They go higher. The the texture, the sound changes anyhow. So just be delicate there, but don't don't try and go over over the top there. I also think comparing the original dynamics with these dynamics, the original does something different and actually highlights, I think, quite nicely this call and response. I'll just play you the, the A section of the original. I knew that would happen. I'll just try it again. Here we go. Forte is what happens there, um, if I could play the right notes. 
So, let's keep going. Uh, dynamics just temper a little bit is my feeling. Next thing I want to look at is the note range. What's the lowest note? What's the highest note? Have a, have a little look through. See if you can find the lowest note. If you spot it, stick it in the chat. What's the lowest note? What's the highest note there? So I reckon the highest note are the E's. For example, the second note, what I would call E6, because it's the sixth octave up, and you get it at 17. Um, the lowest note. This is an interesting one. There is one G2 down here. Only one. <laughs> Only comes once. Um, everything else is around bass C here. So really the range, I think, on the whole is from bass C up to that E. There's one, two, three, three, three and three notes. Yeah. So that's the range, quite, quite a close range really, I think. Harmony is the next part of the analysis before I move on. Um, very traditional chords, I think, on, on the whole, lots of lots of chord five, sevens, chord one, bar seven to eight, for example, bar seven to eight, this bit. One C, five, seven, one, nice perfect cadence. If you want to get your students thinking ahead, being able to recognise cadences, that's a nice exercise, or even for for uh, more advanced students who are needing to recognise the cadences, why not use this? Um, so, yeah, and then we have it in chord five, in, in G as well, as I've already said, we have this chord five, seven, in G major. Um, one interesting chord, two interesting chords he uses a lot of is chord one, so C major, C, E, G, with a flattened seven, because he keeps putting B flats in. Oh, so he's, in other words, he's kind of oh, hinting at going off to F. We're not going off to F at all, but that's that that's sort of the feeling of it. If you look at bar five, he does that. It's a blue note. It's a blue note because ragtime is one of the predecessors of jazz. Yeah, one of the antecedents of jazz. So um, there we have some blue notes. And the other chord that he uses somewhere, and I did this the other day and I, then I couldn't find it, was chord two, that he uses a major version of chord two quite often. Oh yeah, two seven, yeah. So, but I think the, the, um, the blue B flats, those are all uh, blue notes. Moving on, textures, textures. What have we got? Oh, we've got stride bass. One of the other features of, ja of, of rap time is stride bass. And it's one of the things your students are probably gonna struggle with the most in this piece, is that stride bass. Um, and over the stride bass, we have a melody. So melody the accompaniment, but basically um, is, is the basic texture going on there. Now, what about the mood and the expressive qualities? So it says, it just says not fast. I'll tell you a story about that in a minute. Um, and it says jocoso. So we want it really quite playfully, happily, gracefully, even I think all those things come into mind. So I just want to tell you a little bit though uh, about the social and cultural background uh, of, of the piece. Um, I've kind of hinted at a few things anyhow, but ragtime really first started to come to the fore um, at the end of the 19th century. And it came from something called ragging, ragging. Now, I say this very frequently to the community that in the late 19th century, the piano was the iPhone of its day. Everybody wanted a piano, everybody wanted to learn the piano, and there were many many piano teachers including Scott Joplin you might like to know so um, everybody wanted to play the piano but not everybody could afford to have piano lessons so they would work it out themselves they would use their ears and coming as a lot of um, black Africans did from uh, black Americans did from Africa they brought the traditions of African music with them we've already talked about 
call and response being one. Another um, thing that the uh, musical idea that came with them was this syncopation idea that we've already talked about. And so that's what they did when they took familiar pieces of music, they would rag them, they would syncopate them, anticipate the beat. Um, let's take a song like... A song you'll all know. Why not do it in ragtime style? Just with a little syncopated rhythm there, you have got a sense of ragtime, the syncopation just changing it. Um, so ragtime really began to become very, very popular um, towards the end of the 19th century and really became very well known as a result of the Chicago World Trade Fair, which I think was in, I'm just trying to remember, 1889, something like that. Um, Scott Joplin, Scott Joplin was born sort of in 1867 to 8, nobody's quite sure. And his parents were both, both played musical instruments, but his dad worked on the railway and was a labourer and his mum was a cleaner. So they were a very, very poor family. And <clears throat> when uh, Joplin was, was young, he used to go with his mum to the house that she was cleaning and they would allow him to play on the piano there. How nice is that? They would allow him to play on the piano there. And that's how he got started, probably just playing by ear. But very soon somebody, a, a, a German music teacher in the town, um, realised that Joplin actually was quite good at this and had some musical potential. And so he gave him free piano lessons all the way through his teenage years. And I just think that's a wonderful story to be sharing with your students that that this, this young, poor boy was given free piano lessons and that's how we come to have and love his music to these days. Because I do think it's important that as piano teachers we are more than that. We are embedding with it, helping our students to develop a love of music, an association of the music they're playing with the world outside of their piano studio. And this piece in particular, I think, is a brilliant piece that can really help them to connect to that world and what's happened historically for it. Anyhow, Joplin learned to play the piano. He, um, when he left school, he did go on to the railways originally and work with his dad, but then wasn't very happy at all uh, doing that. So he went off and was an itinerant musician, traveling all over the place. Eventually he, um, well, he heard ragtime like everybody else and he settled down somewhere in Missouri and he taught the piano, he taught the piano, um, as well as writing ragtimes, uh, rags. And he wrote about 40, I think, in his life and he was very well known for his, as he is today, you know, for his, his rags. But he wasn't the only person writing them. His, his most well-known and his probably his launching rag, if you like, was the maple leaf rag. And I'm sure some of you will know this. themselves in other words people that musicians who went around playing the pianos for a job for a living kind of used to have um, speed contests I hate to say and used to try and play them as fast as they possibly could which is why all Joplin's rags say not too fast at the top of them to prevent people from from speed playing you know I think <laughs> on the maple leaf it says tempo de marcha in the tempo of march and i think that's what all these ragtimes are really they come out of the marching band tradition so not too fast it's a two-step the entertainer is 
and um, very specific, not too fast. Quite hard to do, I think, with pupils sometimes, maybe. Okay, so I think that's enough, really, about the background, the social and the cultural background. I'm just wondering, Hannah, are there any questions at this point? I think everyone's enjoying your presentation at the moment, Sally, but please do put um, any questions that crop up to you in the chat. We'd love to um, answer them for you. So if anything comes to mind, then do let us know. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And any, any bits that you think, oh, I'd, I'd like to know about that, Sally, you know, could you, could you help me tackle it? Then, um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm very happy to Well, help. we do have one actually from, from Hannah. It says, any tips for reading base clef notes for students that struggle with this? I have. Hang on to your hat there, Ham. Yeah, it's coming up, it's coming up, it's coming up. So let's, um, okay, I'm just going to go back. Yes, I'm going to go back to there, to teaching a piece. So we've looked at the analysis. Um, and that really gives me a sense of what do I need to brainstorm? For example, how am I going to get them to read all those left-hand notes? <laughs> exactly reading my mind there, Ham, I think you are. Um, wasn't that Hannah, was it? It was Vicky. Sorry. Um, so now, how do we teach this? How do we teach it in a curious and creative way? I can see that I, the left hand is going to be a problem. How do I do that? Getting them to do the stride base, that's going to be a problem. Um, how do I get them to do the coordination? Yeah, how do I do that with them? I'm doing this with a young lad. <clears throat> And I was introducing it to him yesterday in the way I'm about to show you. Um, I said, and what do you think some of the challenges are here, William? He said, looked at it and went, coordination, Sally. <laughs> Absolutely right on there, William. Yeah? Coordination is a problem. We have a question from Catherine, um, Sally. Just um, Could you just explain what you mean by stride-based? Can you just break that okay. down? I'm gonna, I am going to come back to that. So thank you, mm -hmm. Catherine, for that. We will come back to that. Um, so, yes, let's, let's do that right now. Um, okay, I'm going to come off, I'm going to see if I can come off this for a moment. It was being a bit silly beforehand, but let's see if I can now get... Nope, it's not going to work. Have I, can you still see my screen? Hannah. No, at the moment we've um, we've lost your presentation, but um, we can see you. Um, you can see right. me. Fine, yes, that's beautifully. Okay. Yes. Yeah. All right. I just don't know how to get me back. No, not to worry. So a stride base is when we take a triad, for example, C E G. Yeah. We've got these three primary triads. One. Knowing that is essential, absolutely essential to this. I'm going to do it, um, I can do it in C, yeah. let's do it in C because that's the key of the piece. C, E, G, now I'm just going to break it up like that. So that's the stride bass. of the entertainer let me just find that again um, where it really is striding <laughs> where the left hand is just doing this up and down the piano you'll have seen jazz musicians do this many many times and you look at them in awe at least I don't go mm, goodness me how do, you, how do you even find your way around but that is stride bass Thank you, so, that was really helpful actually to see you, um, your hands there, it was very good, thank you. Totally. Good, 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 yeah. good. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so I think one thing that you have to do is, they, your student needs to be knowing what stride bass is um, and playing some pieces with a stride bass before they get on to playing the entertainer. Um, if you use something like Piano Safari, the Piano Safari books, you'll find that in book three, in the technique book, there is lots and lots and lots of work on stride bass in various keys. 
So if you're not familiar with Piano Safari, do go and get the Piano Safari repertoire and the Piano Safari technique books. This is the repertoire book where you will find quite a big emphasis on stride bass. Um, you might also like to do in Piano Safari repertoire, there is something called the Chromatic Rag by Christopher Fisher. And this is sort of a, an easier version because it's got the stride bass. I'm in F major. going on there because believe you me the coordination is going to be a challenge for them. Another rag time I found is Snowball Rag and Snowball Rag is from the Piano Time Jazz books. This is book two. Piano Time Jazz book two. It's got like my little post-it notes everywhere you go. Um, and this is by Fiona McArdle and again this has this another stride bass there. moving around. So you'll notice that when with both of those the left hand has got to be very confident, really really confident in what it does and um, it's difficult to to do the left hand confidently and read the notes at the same time. Okay. Even when I play the original entertainer, as <laughs> you might have seen, even the bit I botched, you know, I'm, I'm tending not to um, look at the music too much, I just like looking down all the time. I can get it right, honestly. Um, so th there's so much going on that I, I'm tending to not look at the music, but look at my hands so I can do that coordination. You'll be wise as a teacher to think about how you want to teach the notes, how you want to teach the reading elements, and how you want to teach that uh, stride movement. You want them to do it confidently. So, let's see. Um, I need to come back to that in a minute, actually. I need to come back to that in a minute. First of all, I need to just get and end my presentation somehow, because um, I need to restart it. So let me just come... <laughs> I had problems with this before, folks, so you just have to bear with me a little bit here while I just get myself and doing that. Thanks for that demonstration, Sally. That was super helpful, actually. So, Good. Um, really nice to have some other examples of other repertoire, with, which is complimentary because it's good to get students exploring the style. So again, if you have any other ideas for that, please drop them in the chat. If you've got other pieces, other rags that you've taught at this kind of yeah. level, that's great. Yeah, yeah. So just before I look at that left hand in a little bit more detail, I just wanted to talk um, a little bit about the other problems, the other um, tricky bits, as I like to call them. If I can work out the tricky bits before I teach it, then actually I can anticipate them and, and just really make it, make it work for them. So one tricky bit is the coordination. So what I might do there is I might... Um, teach the right hand rhythm and teach the left hand rhythm separately before I actually put them together and I might even get them to do stuff on their knees. We're going to come back to that in a minute. Another tricky bit actually is going from the bottom of the first page all the way up to this bit here. So you've got... that is a problem. So the way I would go about doing that, my, my idea for doing that would be actually to teach this bit first. Get them playing that completely in isolation. Nothing to do with the rest of the music. So they're very familiar with where they are. Um, and then we'd work backwards. We now come to the previous bar. 
I'm looking at, um, if you're looking at the music bar 16. Now when I come to move, what has to happen is my eye has to see the note before my finger moves to it. I'll say it again. My eye has to see the note, or even my eyes, because I'm not going to look at it with my eye. My eyes have to see the note, I'm going to, this one, before my hand moves to it. So I know, actually I pointed to the wrong one, I should be looking at an E there. So I'm going to look at that E and I'm going to move, cut that, I, am, I do want the C because I want the upbeat. So I'm going to look at the C with my eye, and I'm going to pick up my hand, my arm, and move to the C. Yeah? So I'm here, I'm looking, and now I'm moving. So that's the first part. Second thing to think about, my left hand is going to play the same note, but with a different finger. So I, I need to make sure that moves to a finger five. So what I'm going to do, and this is you hearing my brain thinking now, I'm going to look at the C for the right hand, I'm going to move that, and as I move, my left hand comes off and changes my finger. Like that. And you have to be that deliberate about it, really. That deliberate. What is the problem? What is the sequence? How can I get them to do it? Step by step, you have to work it out. So it's hard for us as teachers because we just can do it. And it's, it's rolling yourself backwards to be a student again that, um, that, that can be very, very hard work indeed. Okay, so once I've done my analysis, I can get on with starting to teach the piece. And um, what I'm going to do, no, no, what I'm going to do, first of all, is I'm going to play the piece all the way through to the student. I want them to hear and listen carefully to how it sounds, the mood of it. I want to ask them questions about it. I want them to find out, you know, something just by listening. So I'm not going to show them the music. I am just going to let them listen. And we have these mood cards. These are all separate cards, by the way. Let me just get them here. We have lots of separate cards. I don't know where I've put them now. Here they go. Already taken them out. You can put them on top of the piano, these mood cards, like that one. Grumpy. And you play it through, and as you play it, you ask them to select the cards that you, that they think um, sum up the mood of the piece. What does that do? Well, it gets them listening, gets them engaged in their listening, gives them a real focus, as well as just enjoying hearing the piece all the way through. So in week one, I'd play it through. They'd listen to it like that. And then I'd send them home with something like this. This is what... I call, we call the general discovery sheet. And this is for them to start to discover about things for themselves, about the piece. Um, it's asking them questions, you know, like what key are they in? And then they have to, it gives them an activity to do as well. And what accidentals, oh, they'll have a good old time with accidentals in this piece, won't it? And it, it shows you all sorts of things about the students when they bring them back, you know. What's an accidental again, Sally? You know how information goes in one ear and out the other sometimes with them. And it might take a couple of weeks for them to work through this completely, but as they do so, they are getting familiar with the school. They are having to work things out for themselves because I want them to be independent learners. I don't want them to be dependent on me for all the learning that's going to happen. So let's take, for example, um, what is the highest note in the piece? What is the lowest note in the piece? Remember, we looked at that in the content sheet. Um, so to do that, they've got to work out what the notes are. Okay, so that way we're practicing our notation. Remember, this is grade three, yeah? They're not as skillful at reading as you are. They're still not as skillful at reading. Reading is still something they are practicing. And you, the teacher, have to look at a way that you understand that technically they won't be able to read and kind of deliver complex technical things at the same time in your average pupil. So, for a couple of weeks, they'll take the general discovery sheet or something similar um, away with them and that will make them familiar with the music. Okay, so now somebody was asking about the bass line. 
and I will often write out specific parts of the music that I think are tricky for them. Yes, it takes time, but that way I'm absolutely certain that they're going to learn it in a healthy way and in a productive way rather than them coming back the next week, you know, and absolutely <sighs> murdering it on here and you're going, oh no, I've got all this to put right now. Okay. So for this one, again, if you're a curious member, you will find this appearing. <clears throat> look out for it in the newsletter tomorrow. Um, oh, look, we've got a curious bass line. So this is how I would break it down for them to learn. They're going to start by just doing certain notes. Let me just go and find my learning journey here. For example, playing the first note and staying there until they can move to the next one. And staying there until they move to the next one. And so on and so forth. And then at the bottom they have to tick. I can play all the right notes. Yes. I can play all I can play the correct fingering. Yes. But can they play all the right notes and the correct fingering? Now, my students love doing this sort of thing because they find it quite challenging and it's giving them independence. It's making sure that they know, you know, they're, that they're in charge of their learning journey for this piece. So that's that's the first one. The second one does these chords. So here you've got that one. This really needs some, some pause marks on it as well. You can write those in maybe. And it's exactly the same thing, you know, can they tick them and say they've got all the right notes. You can decide together how many times they're going to need to do that to be really sure of it before they can go on to the next one, which looks like this. So with this one, I'm going to use something that um, Graham Fitch calls plus one, plus one, which is why you've got the um, pauses on there. So they start on the first note, and it's a bit like snakes and ladders. They can only go to the next pause when they can do the next uh, little group of notes fluently. So. Play that one again and they need to go to the next pause and so on and so forth now this sort of practice is very detailed it's very adult practice expecting a child to do it i think from the score is is going to be too much for them i reckon they they, they, they wouldn't be able to cope with it on the whole i'd love to hear your thoughts about that but for me, I need to extract it for them. And also it stops them from just playing, you know. I wouldn't say it completely stops them, but, but it, it, it kind of puts the brakes on for them a little bit. And as I say, it's, it's quite a, an adult way of practicing this. I was just gonna say something else about that, but I can't remember. I know what I was gonna say. Technically, technically, Let's just talk about that for a moment, this bass line. The hand has to stay in neutral. By that, I mean this shape. Yeah, that's a neutral hand when it's like that. What we want to avoid is them stretching. Stretching is not good. You just stretch your hand out. What can you feel across here? Tension, 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 yeah, everywhere. And that is not going to lead to a nice sound. That's going to end... <laughs> the finger to the notes. The arm takes the hand and the finger to the note. So the fingers never act independently in terms of movement around the piano. It's the arm that takes the note. Some basics matter here. How far are they sitting away from the piano? Can they stand sideways, for example, between the keys and the piano stool? Very good way of finding out. Because those arms need to float onto the keys. That needs to be a lovely light arm here in order for that to happen. 
So just a little technical point there. And then we can look at this sheet. So this sheet could be used at the beginning, before you start that base work, or it might be used in the middle. But this is the, the, the reinforcement or the learning of the notes that the student might struggle with. So we're not asking them to play this. What we're asking them to do is to write in the names of the notes there. Yeah? So that is quite tricky to do because they've got three notes every, every single time. And obviously this is just a small part of the bass line. As we've looked at, there's a whole B section and there's various other things that go on. So it is a complex bass line, this. And I'm not expecting my students to read it and learn it like that. I am expecting them to know these notes and I'm, ex I'm wanting them to practice their, their note recognition and knowing the chords and the shapes of the chords. Because this also is, is blocking those chords. So if they could write in the names of the notes, you could ask them to write in the fingering. Then you could ask them to play them, etc. Okay, so th those are some ideas for that bass line, how to get that bass line going. And then I think the next thing is the rhythm. So here we've got that syncopated rhythm. So synco, ta ta, ti ti ta, rest, rest, synco, ta ta, ti ti ta, rest, rest. I use rhythm language. You could make up words to go with it. You can use one and two and three, four and one, two, three, four. Yeah, up, up to you. The problem with that one is that you are in two, two, and really you do want to count in two, but you can't at that particular moment with that. But I would do that rhythm first, and then I would go on to this. That's hard. <laughs> That's hard to clap because I was trying to do it last night. Um, and then I might go on to this. Okay. Now you can have lots of fun with this. Let's all stand up for a moment and um, give ourselves a shake. Yeah. And I'd like you to walk the beat with your feet. One, two, one, and then I'm going to clap the rhythm and I want you to clap it back to me. But we have to keep the feet going all the time. Ready? My turn. Over to you. My turn again. Over to you. My turn. Your turn. Be careful. Absolutely. We're off the piano stool, our brain is working again, our body has started to work again, and it's a bit of a challenge and it's a good giggle. That's how all learning happens when you have a bit of bit of fun and laughter. Okay. That's some rhythm work. Okay, we're getting going now, you know. I know I'm uh, bear with me, I've got a little bit more content to share with you, so um do stay if you can. Um we get them going on that beginning stage by messing around a little bit with the music, by breaking it up a little bit, not learning from bar one. We haven't even talked about the first line. Yeah, We want to take the bits that they, we know they're going to struggle with and we want to introduce those in, in engaging ways that are going to get them thinking. There is a lot to learn in this piece. It is going to take a little bit of time. You will have to dig into it and just work out some of the other passages using the same kind of creative, slightly curious ways of doing it. Your student will love it. They will also love it because they love the piece and they will be highly motivated. But they will get to a stage with the piece in the middle bit of learning where it doesn't seem to get any better possibly and they feel as though they're kind of in a bit of a rut. So this is the time where you want to say, okay, let's be curious. Can you be curious? What's, what's working and what isn't working? So on this kind of chart, you can see that I've broken it down. Tempo and rhythm, you know, 
how is the tempo? And at the uh, left-hand side, you can say, see, it says some way to go. And in the middle, it's on its way. And on the other side, it's awesome. Are they keeping a steady tempo? Are they able to play rhythmically? Again, I find students, you ask them the right question about this, and they will be able to tell you whether or not they are on the way or still some way to go. Notes and fingering. Again, it might be something that's, uh, that they're struggling with. Fingering in particular with this piece, you've just got to use the fingering that is correct for your students. And can you remind me, I just need to talk about fingering a little bit before the end of, of the presentation, but not right now. Ownership, there's another one that might be something you come back to later on. But there are, yeah, there are some more to do with that. But that is just to help them over that middle section of learning as is this one and you can also use this towards the end of their learning journey really i can play all the right notes yeah they have to self-assess it i use self-assessment like this all the time that's it's their learning not me they need to be the one who tells me i can do this i can i can um can they play the right rhythms uh, can they play with a steady beat all the way through probably not can you play at the right tempo? Probably not. But do they know that? Do they know that? The key question on here is, I enjoy playing the music. Now, if that is down on the no, <laughs> not there yet, then you are possibly going to struggle because they've got to enjoy playing it. Otherwise, the struggle that they're having with notes, with, with coordination, with rhythm, you know, it, they're not going to want to persist if they are struggling with it because they don't enjoy it. You know, you think about when you have to do things you don't enjoy, it kind of feels a bit heavy, doesn't it, really? So, do they enjoy it? You can also ask them what they want to work on next and, and get them to come up with some ideas uh, for strategies to use. Okay. All right, so I think that is just about the end of that little bit. I know I need to talk about fingering. So I just want to say thanks again to um, ABRSM for letting us use that. There we go. And I'm going to stop my share. So I just want to um, come back to any questions we got at the moment. But those, those sheets that I've just shown you at the end, that kind of sheet, even if you, you haven't got hold of those sheets, they help the student to take ownership. That it makes them their, it gives it it makes it their piece of music, not just a piece they've learned, but can they play it with character? Can they play it with colour? Can they play it with a sense of oh, I can play this piece. I can play it this piece. Fingering. Um, the fingering of this piece, uh, the way it's being done here, um, you know, it is a suggested fingering. Don't feel that you have to stick to it. So for example in bar five, the suggested fingering for the left hand was uh, five here, one and two, then a three, then a one and two. My feeling is that that's just a little too complicated. So I'm going to say to my students, we're going to do one and three there, and then a three, so I'm not changing from two to three. The other thing that I had a question from Julianne Ingram about was the fingering in bar 22, which is, it's this bit. Three, two, one, two, three, two, one, two. So that is a little bit stretchy. Certainly a bit stretchy for my hand, and it doesn't feel terribly pianistic. I went back to the original, and of course, in the original, you're in octaves. Yeah, you're all in octaves. Uh, all this bit is... just come off. Five, three, one, yeah. 
there's a there's a, a tide note there, so it, it just gives that opportunity to do that thing. All right, and I think that's probably all that I have to share about that wonderful piece of music and all the lovely teaching points that we can get out of it um, for the moment. Unless there are any questions, Hannah, I would have a look. Really helpful suggestion, Sally, um, especially isolating notes. I love the part where you're getting them to focus on just the bass line, and that's all they're looking at. It's sometimes so helpful, going back to Hannah's question earlier about <coughs> helping them to read, it's mm. just, just getting them to match what they're seeing. One of the tools that I use is I have a note recognition app, and before you actually launch into the game, there's a, there's a stave where you can light up the notes that you want them to be tested on. So actually, you can say, well, what note is that? Can you light mm -hmm. it up on the screen absolutely. for me? Um, yeah. yeah, but if they know what intervals look like, then... Yep, ab absolutely. I think, you know, one of the main things to take away from this is, what are you going to teach them in the piece that's going to help their reading? Yeah. And what do you need to teach them? What are the technical problems in the piece that you're going to just teach them by rote? Yeah, just teach them by rote. Don't try and confuse the two things because that's where children just go, oh, ha, ha. it's too hard for me and they will give up. And this is the stage, grade three, is where they will give up often because their note reading isn't secure enough to cope with the score like that. Okay? But as a wise, sensible teacher, we know how to balance the two. Continue to develop their note, but teach them uh, the bits they can't read by rote. That's nothing wrong with that at all. Well, I think that's just about bringing us to the end today. And uh, I'd like to say a huge thank you to all of you for coming along and, and listening. Um, if you're not a member of our Curious Piano Teachers community, then I think there is a link. I don't know whether you've already shared it, Hannah, but um, there is no, a link that you I'll can... I'll pop it there again, actually. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, it might um, up there. Or if you would like to just subscribe to our newsletter that comes out on a, on a Friday... Oh, no, on a Wednesday, isn't it? Our Curiosity Zone. We like to share with um, as many people as we possibly can, completely free. Um, you'll get notice about upcoming free webinars, which we're going to be running one every every month going on got an exciting one hopefully for next month or soon after then do pop your email addresses let us have your email addresses in the in the chat or send them to us separately at info at curiouspiano.org you could send send your email address to there and we will get you on our mailing list hannah uh, thank you so much for fielding all those questions Thank you, Sally. That was really helpful, and I hope everyone's enjoyed it. Um, please do um, continue to um, let us know your questions. You know, we're always here if you have questions. Um, so do kind of email us, Hannah or Sally at Curious, and we'll be glad to glad to help. So absolutely, yes. absolutely. All right. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye.